Hello, you're listening to the State of Startups with Industry Analysts. We shine a light on the interplay of startups, their ecosystem, and industry analysts in the B2B tech space. That is, real experiences from real people solving the same challenges that you're dealing with, too. You're hosted by Chris Holscher and Robin Schaefer. Enjoy this session. Hello, all. Hey, Chris, how's life? Hey, Robin. Robin, good to see you. Um, life is great. Life is great. Um, I'm, I'm really looking forward to, to a nice holiday break. Oh, that sounds great. Are you going anywhere nice? <laughs> of course, yeah. We can't wait to go to Norway again, um, way up north. We'll, we'll go hiking in, uh, in the mountains in the Rundane uh, area and then relax in the skerries around uh, Bergen. So very much looking forward to it. How are you? Yeah, I'm good. I'm, I'm very excited about our guest today. In this interview, we're, we're, we're presenting, uh, very happy to present Sean Rogers, who is a longtime analyst, and now he is recently with, with Bark Research in Germany. Yay! <laughs> Bark Research, uh, they're an amazing company. They they are, um, they're a university spin-out. Did you know that? Um, no, I didn't. And they, they focus on, on data and business intelligence and analytics. So, Really, really um, important topics uh, this day and age, um, and one of the leading specialists in this field in Europe, definitely. That's great. That's great. And I know they're really breaking into the U.S. with Sean on board now, so I'm excited about that because I've worked with them for years. Anyway, Sean talked about the value of startups to analysts in their in the analyst quest to keep up with innovation and to challenge the status quo with established vendors, and it's an area almost completely misunderstood by startups. Right. And and then we also talked about one of the biggest challenges or, or opportunities, if you will, for startups with analysts. And that was, what do you do when there is no report or no coverage, apparently, in your space? So really interesting. Buckle up your seat belts and, and come in on the right. <music> So hello, everybody. We are the State of Startups with Industry Analysts again, and we have Robin Sheffer, as always, myself, Chris Holscher, and we have a guest, Sean Rogers of Bark Research. And I'm very excited because we haven't actually spoken yet, Sean, um, but Bark is from Germany, where I'm located as well. So I'm excited to have you on the show, and um, let's dive right in. Who are you, and why are we talking about the State of Startups with Industry Analysts? Well, I'm Sean Rogers. Uh, I've been in the industry and as an industry influencer and analyst for uh, more years than I care to count. Uh, and I've recently partnered with uh, Bark, uh, who, as you mentioned, is a very successful uh, firm that's out of the German and Dock region. Uh, they've been in business for 25 years and have a great, great reputation in the space for being highly unbiased and running really great research and surveys uh, and just doing exemplary analyst work. Uh, the founder, uh, Dr. Karsten Bang, is a good personal friend of mine, and uh, uh, things kind of crisscrossed in a great way recently, and we've partnered up to extend Bark's presence here in the United States. Bark has done a lot of business with U.S. vendors, but there's nothing like having someone here physically uh, and having uh, the ability to be on the right time uh, zones and to interact more closely with our customers and our prospects. So I'm super excited to be uh, the first of many, uh, I expect, employees of Bark here in the U.S. So uh, that's what I'm doing today. That's great news for me because I've had a lot of experience with Bark, and I do agree they are. You are a great firm, and I'm so thrilled to see you extending into the into the North America. Yeah, I think it's I think it's a great move for our customers and for prospects, and 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 more specifically for your audience, startups, because we love talking to startups. So, and, and what do you specialize in? Because I I know, but maybe you can share with the audience because Bark definitely has specialization. Yeah, so Bark as a whole specializes and leads into the market from a data uh, and analytics perspective, and I do as well. So I've got over almost 30 years of experience in that market. Uh, so it, again, from a topical standpoint, we lined up quite well. Bark also covers uh, CPM, BPM uh, type technologies and digital workplace. So uh, we have expertise in three areas specifically, but for me and leading into the U.S. market, I'll be uh, focused 
focused on companies that are dealing with data and data management and sort of the exciting things around AI and ML and analytics and everything in between. So it's a broad market for me. Oh, wow. That's great. So um, AI analytics, yes. Machine learning, I suppose. Right, yeah. Interesting field, really interesting field. Just had a client in that space. So uh, yeah. that might be a nice connection. <laughs> so remind me, where, where in North America do you sit? Which which city? Where are I, you from? I'm located in the Boulder, Colorado area. So kind of right in the, right, kind of in the center, a little off to the left. Uh, so uh, in the Western United States, but it's a great base for traveling and uh, being at events and, and getting out and there. And living. It's a great base for living. I love Boulder, Colorado. It, it is. It's often listed as one of those top 10 sort of cities to be in, uh, in the U S and uh, yeah, I, I came out here 23 years ago to be here for perhaps five years and I'm not leaving. So I, I, I like it here quite a bit. Right. So how did you personally, how did you become an industry analyst? How, how did that happen? You know, I don't think any of us go to college thinking when I grow up, I'm going to be an industry analyst. Um, or, it, it, or an industry analyst uh, relations person. Right, right. You know, it just it's just not one of those uh, job titles that we think about when we're young. I, I kind of backed into it through the process of originally becoming a, more or less a member of the press. I was one of the co-founders of a print magazine uh, back in the 90s called DM or Data Management Review. And so topically, it, it was where my experience is. Um, and we were fortunate to have an exit from that company. Uh, and a year or two later, my business partner and I co-founded another company, again, in this space, which was called the Business Intelligence Network. And we skipped the print and the paper that time and just went completely online. Uh, and when we did that, we built out about 18 different websites with regional language and regional writers and experts. And coincidentally, uh, my partner for my German version of the Business Intelligence network was Bark. And so that began our relationship many years back. And that relationship on the BI network was very successful. And uh, Bark and I went on to co-found an event uh, in Germany that we have uh, we ran together for quite some time. It is now uh, a property and a program under the Bark umbrella. But uh, yeah, we, we did a lot of those things. So the print magazine to the big web community uh, it was that was how I got there. And then when I sold the BI network, I was approached by a good friend who said, how would you like to be entrepreneurial one more time? Uh, but not have to talk to the attorneys or pay the rent. And a friend of mine offered me an opportunity to found a BI and data warehousing practice as an analyst within his analyst firm at Enterprise Management Associates, which oh, is okay. uh, an analyst firm here in Boulder and had a great time working with them for four and a half, five years. Uh, and acted as the lead analyst there and covered the same topics I'll be covering uh, again in the interim. I got drawn to the vendor side. Uh, so I was the chief research officer for Dell Software. I worked for Quest Software. I ran uh, a, a platform called Statistica, a data science platform that was owned by both of those companies, and eventually was on board with Statistica as it was sold to Tipco Software. So I come to the market as an analyst with a lot of experience over a 30 year period, but a nice balance of yeah. enterprise software. So I get what our customers are going through when they're trying to break into markets and when they're trying to put the right narrative or the right go to market message in space or trying to understand their competition. And so when you combine both of those, it gives me somewhat of a unique perspective. So, yeah, yeah I would say that's really powerful. Glad so it's not, it's not there. just read the book, seen the movie, you've been there. <laughs> I have been there a little bit. Yeah, as you can, we're on video today, so you can tell I'm not 20 years old anymore. Uh, so I do have, I, I have a little experience in the rearview mirror. And, uh, you know, when I decided uh, to pick a, a new direction for myself uh, uh, in, a, in the last couple of months, I knew that I wanted to uh, continue on as an analyst and, and get back to my core work there. So I'm excited to be doing this again. Great. I'd love to switch gears to the startup community. And I know uh, I'd love to understand how, you know, your experience with that, um, particularly as you look towards more working with Bark, but how do you, how do you see 
uh, startups and analysts working together and the mutual value and, and, and how that relationship goes. Yeah, there's definitely a cool back and forth ecosystem with startups. I have to be honest, you know, I can sit here and read white papers all day uh, to keep up with trends, but the best way to keep up with the innovation in any market is to talk to startups and the executives that are behind them. I come off of these calls with startup CEOs and startup uh, technical people having to go do my own homework. Um, it's fun going to a briefing when you learn something new and it often comes from the startup community. And that's not to say that the big enterprise guys aren't innovating. I'm just saying that it's very consistent with startups where you are learning about new things, or even if it's not a brand new idea, it's a new kind of vector or uh, angle to come at things that are happening. And I think that startups get to you know, they get to start with a clean slate. So they get to be really inventive and they're not carrying a lot of luggage around with them of the old traditional constraints that some of the bigger companies have. So you see really cool things from the startup community. I do know that some analyst firms uh, shy away from doing briefings with startups sometimes because they don't feel like, oh, there's not a big budget there and they might not hire my firm. And I, I just, I... I honestly, I just don't care. It's it's time well spent and it's beneficial. And I like to think that I bring value to the conversation with a startup as well. So that's a great point. Uh, and I find it a common, I don't know if Chris, you would agree, but I find it a common perception that startups don't recognize that value that they deliver to analysts and, and why analysts are interested in them. They think yeah. they're too small, they're too, they don't have enough customers, <clears throat> enough revenue. Do you find the same thing, uh, Sean or Chris? Well, one question that I get a lot is, you know, startups assume they won't make it onto a high profile report. Or maybe there isn't even a report in their field because it's they're pursuing a new angle or something. And therefore, they think there is no reason for them to engage. What I, I think I think laying a foundation with the analyst community as a whole uh, when you're a startup is really important for, for those reasons exactly. Yes, you may not have the critical impact or market impact to make uh, – to make that big report, but most of the firms in the market like to highlight up and comers or disruptive technologies that are, you know, being seen in the space. And the other side is if, if there's not reports or research being done in your sector uh, or space, oh my gosh, that's exactly why you need to talk to analysts because analysts are always looking or what should I be thinking about next? Or where should I be going next? You know, uh, uh, ChatGBT is a great example. It's a super hot technology. We all see it in our headlines every single day, but it's kind of new-ish in the market. Uh, and now I can't go through a briefing without hearing about that topic. As a matter of fact, I play a game with myself during briefings to see how long it takes someone to bring up ChatGBT um, like, in a briefing. It's like buzzword bingo with that one, right? It is, right? Yeah. And But to your point about, you know, I might not make the big report or they don't have one, that's exactly why you have to talk to analysts because you need to let them know that you're there or you get this opportunity to authentically educate analysts or the community in general about what you're doing and maybe why a report is really necessary. It's uh, I've seen it a hundred times. It happens constantly. I, I remember many years back uh, when the first executive, uh, he, we were having coffee. We were good friends and we were kind of doing a briefing, but it was, it was social. And he said, uh, have you heard about Hadoop? And I went, and, and for those of you listening, Hadoop is a big data technology that, you know, popped up a, few, a handful of years ago. I mean, I thought it was, the, it was, the, that word was as goofy as the first time I heard Google, you know, and, and I'm looking at him going, what are you talking about? And I, honest to goodness, had never heard the phrase. The CTO of that company educated me that day so much that I took the napkin he was writing on. And I said, oh, no, the napkin's coming back with me. And, and needless to say, if you understand data, uh, Hadoop was the biggest thing. For, there were shows and events, and uh, you couldn't go anywhere without hearing the word. But I learned it from a vendor who was thinking about it. And that's really important for analysts. And so, and that company was a mid-sized firm. So they were not a huge enterprise company. Uh, so, yeah, it's, it's important to have that relationship with analysts. Yeah, exactly. I mean, it's it's about you know um, shaping the battlefield. 
You know, if if I'm doing something uniquely new, if I'm uh, looking from a new angle onto the market and nobody knows about it, I want the guys who do nothing else but look at that market all day long and talk about that market all day long and talk to my end clients all day long. I want them to know my new angle and I want to raise the bar for my competitors by introducing my new you know perspectives my new capabilities that maybe nobody else has on the radar so i'm raising the bar by talking to analysts and making it more difficult for others to play on the playing field that i define exactly exactly and and from an analyst perspective you know uh, let me be candid i i use the word hadoop a lot in the weeks after i met with that cto uh, because i wanted to be informed and i went off and did more research on the topic and 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 then it allowed me to uh bring extra value to all my advisory calls to all of my interactions when i spoke publicly and and granted, when I when I do those things, I don't always lead with, did you know that XYZ Corp does this? Because that's not how it always happens. But when you have analysts out there, to your point, Chris, uh, kind of curating the, the thinking around a particular subject, that comes from that beginning of analysts either uh, identifying or learning or seeing things that small smaller vendors are often doing. And believe me, the Hadoop ecosystem started with a lot of startups, a lot of startups. Mm-hmm. So, mm-hmm. Yeah. yeah. I wanted to ask you, if, if you look at working with analysts, there's kind of a what we've been talking about now, kind of a getting your brand out there, getting your name out there, getting the concepts out there, getting stories out there in the the guise of, or the area of marketing sales under that hat. Yeah. And, and that's valid. And then there's another whole side, which is about analysts almost being like an extension of your brain and helping you in the company bring in new perspectives and new information. And I find that startups are much, much uh, more able to take in that and act on that information. So I'm curious your thoughts about that. I, I think the best analysts for startup companies are the ones that are able to pop the bubble. And 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 what I mean by that is, is boy, startup firms are head down, right? They're just every day, 14 hours a day. You know, I, I once heard a, a, a comment about entrepreneurs that they'd much rather work 16 to 20 hours a day to avoid working eight hours a day for someone else. And and they live in this sort of, and I don't want to call it an echo chamber, but a bubble, right? They're just head down. They're just sweating and diligently working. And they don't always have this expansive view of their market. They have a very keen view of their innovation and the vector they might be taking into the market. But an experienced analyst can come in and help let some of the air out of that bubble and expose you to bigger thinking. Um, I joke a little bit about why I get asked, why do you like being an analyst? And I do have a jokey answer, which is I really enjoy knowing everything. And what I mean by that is, is I don't know everything, but you get so informed as an analyst. So I've had like, I've had six industry briefings in the last 72 hours. So I've talked to six companies in the data and analytics space for over an hour uh, with each of them. I've talked with their executives. I understand a lot about what their go-to-market motion looks like, understand where they're focusing some of their technologies and startups can't possibly have access to that information. So that's what analysts do. Now, some of the information I have is under NDA or embargoed or private, and I can't share that, but I can give a startup really great strategic uh, impressions of what's happening in the market. I can wave them off if I feel strongly that maybe the path they're on might end up in a dead end because I've heard it ended in a dead end for three other companies recently. So the the market expertise that a good analyst brings is partially just being super well connected and up on the topics and we also get to uh, i find startups go to a handful or a couple of events every year i go to so many i can't count i i literally it, it, you know, I'm at every single major event in the industry and I'm getting behind the scenes briefings on the technology and access to the executives in a way that startups can't. So we bring that to the conversation, the coaching, um, the insights that we provide uh, startup companies. And, you know, I... By the way, that's not just startups. That's for large companies as well. I've, I've been Absolutely. with BP for, for 10 years. Yeah. And they had the very same problem, you know. 
the way that I advise my clients to, to work with analysts is to be 100% open and honest um, and factual about what you're sharing, because that's the only way that I get the best possible feedback and the best possible information back into my system. Yeah. So yeah. that is nothing that you could possibly get by reading your competitor's website or, you know, a, right. a partner because they always have their own agenda. I have a quick comment on that. My observation is unlike BT, where you were there driving and that's special and different, most mid-sized and large companies have a very difficult time taking the input from someone like Sean, the ideas and the suggestions and acting on them because it's like moving the Titanic. It's a big ship and startups are pivoting all the time and they're open and they're taking in information and they're sensing the market. And I just get so much satisfaction as, you know, a, a you know, working with these companies to see the impact that someone like Sean can have on their business, which is way more than a dot in a, in a, a report. It's fundamental, you know, what they're doing and what they're going after. And it can be extremely impactful. Yeah, I, I I agree. I think the impact for an analyst is different with the size of a company uh, and with what the executive teams are like. I have met leaders of products in uh, in various software companies who have told me uh, that, well, I just, I don't listen to the analysts. They're a necessary evil and we have to brief them, blah, blah, blah. And, and okay, fine. And, and I can't, it's not my job to fix you. Um, and so, uh, but I walk out of those companies and walk out of those meetings kind of going, well, yeah, you know, but your revenue's flat and your innovation isn't very exciting and you're kind of a follower in your market and you guys have fallen into this sort of this, this trough of that you may not get out of because your leadership has stopped listening to people. Um, I, and, and every analyst is different. Some of us are better than others, but the, the bottom line is, is we do bring, a unique perspective and you know and, and i get i get asked questions a lot by smaller companies like what should we be doing with you you know or what mistakes should we avoid and i i always go back to ideas like have and you just said it i think robin kind of have authentic conversations with analysts and then select a com couple of really good analysts in your space and create a relationship with them where you're uh, not just briefing them on your features, but uh, sharing your strategies and your concerns about the market, you know, and then find an analyst who's not afraid uh, to tell you when you're wrong in a, in a professional way. I And I think we're all in this space, so we know it. You know, I, I always tell startups, uh, you're probably not the first uh, you're probably and most likely not the only. And yes, you do have competitors. And if you didn't, you, I'd be worried. So, and and I get that a lot in briefings. And you have to be able to go back to the head of analyst relations or to the CEO and say, "Hey, stop saying that." Mm -hmm. You know, it, it be authentic in what we're talking about. Let's ex let's understand that many people are on that same road with you they might be in different lanes and they might be at different speeds but you know there's a there's a bunch of vendors on this path and and also and, there's different ways to solve a problem so yeah, there's a problem yeah. out there there may be just wildly different ways so you don't see them as a competitor because they're right. not offering the same thing but they're yeah. solving the problem in a different way so therefore there are a competitor yeah. And and most of us in the tech space have read The Innovator's Dilemma, and we know that being first sometimes isn't the best thing. So, and you don't get extra brownie points from the analyst community for, quote unquote, being the first. Um, really, the brownie points come in different places. And, uh, but being the first or being the only is not generally the, the thing I want to hear. I really, truly am as interested in your strategy and how you see the market as much as I am on all the, the dials and levers and features that might be in your, uh, your offering. So it's gotta be a balanced piece. Yeah. Yeah. Sometimes the, the, the competition is not necessarily a company that does the exact same thing as you do. It mm -hmm. might even be the DIY in, in, at your customer's organization, or it might be the, old school thinking of the previous category of things that tried to solve that same problem, which is entirely different than what you do. It's Absolutely. An entirely different technology, but still you're competing with that thing. You know? Uh -huh. Yeah. So, I, 
I asked the the straightforward question of a company yesterday, who's your biggest competitor? And I expected them to list two or three companies that show up in their deals. And really what they came back with was exactly what you just said, the traditional approach. It was classic vendors from this arena coupled with professional services groups. And I went, oh, okay, yeah. That makes sense, but that's also slow and it's expensive. So you've got a nice value proposition there. And and we talked about that for a few minutes and it made good sense. So, and that's where you get startups are being innovative. So they're breaking rules. They're disrupting the status quo, which is, is outstanding. So, yeah. yeah. Exciting. It's an exciting place to be. It is. So, it is. Yeah, I think that's a, that, that is a very under, under appreciated aspect to, um, because as you mentioned earlier, that startups are very often very fond of their innovation and rightfully so often times. And, yeah. um, and then it gets difficult to um, to to find a language um, to communicate that innovative, great, fascinating new approach to an audience who's maybe not even familiar with that language, who's mm -hmm. you know, who's in, living in a different time, in a different environment, in a different think way of thinking. And that is sometimes really, really difficult for for young innovative uh, folks to find a language that works with that audience. And um, I find that a great value. I what, wanted to ask. Oh, sorry. Go ahead. Oh, I was just going to say what you're touching on is kind of this new buyer journey that everybody's dealing with, right? By the buyer cycle or journey has really evolved, especially. You know, since the disruption of COVID, um, lots more is being done online, less travel is happening. But during that period, the power uh, of purchasing uh, at end user companies has shifted away from people that we might classify as boomers to the, to the next level. And they expect different things when they're talking to solution providers and they want to hear different narratives. And to your point, being able to speak to the market in a relevant way is incredibly important. And one of those things is, is that sort of third party qualification of your message. So analysts can help a lot in that arena to say, look, here's how you need to speak to the market today to intersect with the buyers of today, because things have changed. Yeah. So, so what do you think um, is different about the buyers of today in terms of what they want to hear that analysts can help with? Like what? I, I, I think what most of the research has shown in the new buyer's journey is, is that they're touching your brand six to seven times before they touch your website. Yeah. And so what does that mean? So it means I'm, I'm looking for information about you somewhere else. And that might mean an analyst research report. It might be uh, an analyst speaking at an event and they go, oh, okay. He mentioned XYZ Corp. I got to put them on my list. Or it might be, uh, you know, a piece of content that you had developed by a firm or that you developed but placed off of your website, maybe at a consolidator site where they have a lot of industry resources or an associate uh, association site. All of those places have become targets, and it's because today's buyers have new tools that allow them to browse those places. And we, we've heard about like third-party reference or review sites are playing a role, uh, and all of those things have really come up a lot harder. Uh, the influencer slash analyst market is really big. Social is huge. I use social uh, as an outlet for myself for writing. Uh, you know, a hundred times more than I did 10 years ago. It's, uh, you know, and, and now I don't even try to do it on my own blog or my own website. I do it on LinkedIn or other kind of big community uh, aggregators of information because I want to intersect with today's consumers in the right location. So, sorry, Chris, I went off on a tangent about uh, 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 buyer's journeys. Did you have another question you wanted to add? Yeah, because we, we touched on... Um on quite a number of difficult topics that are um, wh where there are often misconceptions about it uh, or where the, the value isn't fully um, you know, used. So I was wondering, um, I was wondering if you had a view on the role of AR, analyst relations in that in that field, especially in the context of startups, because they rarely can afford an AR person of their of their own. So what's your take on that? My take is, is you've got to, if you're not prepared or at a point yet where you want to bring in a head of AR, 
uh, you need to partner with people that understand analyst relations from a strategic standpoint. Uh, I just said this to a good AR friend of mine the other day. AR is an art. And the art has a lot of facets to it. It's part networker and relationship building. It's part technology skills and subject matter expertise. Um, it's also, you have to have understand the, the business of it. Um, and, and also you need to create a, an environment when you when you are kind of partnering with someone to help you with this, that it keeps your brand where it needs to be from a, a, a good standpoint. And it also creates this good, positive relationship with uh, analysts. I, I have seen uh, some startups come into the market thinking they can buy their way into the analyst world and then they they'll go off and they'll get a really smart firm to try to help them and i'll see the contention i'll see the smart firm going it's not, it's, we you know we we need to earn our way into this relationship and part of that earning is uh keep me informed keep me in the loop yeah. include yeah. me i i just had a, a really great company the other day who asked me to come to a briefing in advance of an event that they're doing and that's just such a subtle strategy but I wasn't the only analyst in the room. And we sat through a, just a straight hour. It was really well uh, thought out. They had three macro themes for me to walk away with. I could tell you what those themes are, but I'm under embargo. And that's fine because now I'm, I'm knowledgeable and I want to be knowledgeable as their event comes to the market. So that if one of my customers asks, and we do a lot of end user advisory at Bark. And they come to me and they say, hey, I heard XYZ Corp had their event this week. What do I need to know? I already know. And oh, really good firms will help startups understand that these are the components of that strategy. Uh, it's not just as simple as, you know, shotgun and press releases to a bunch of analysts. It's, uh, actually, uh, if you don't mind, I, I want to go back to something where we talked about, and we've been talking, touching on it all, all along, the value that analysts can give kind of on an inbound, you know, insights and advice and direction. We often hear the objection that I only have so many hours in the day, I'm gonna spend them with clients, with prospective customers, because I'm gonna learn as much from them. So how, what would you say to a founder or leader of a startup who, who prioritizes or doesn't see the value of the conversations with analysts because they feel like they're already getting all the input they, that they need from the customers and prospects? So customers are a great source of information. And I would never, you know, say to a founder, hey, you, you, you shouldn't or, or you shouldn't listen. Listening to our customers. And that's why it's that's the upside for me for advisory when I'm talking to end users. They tell me things that I don't fully understand. They give me insights into real world stuff. But I talk to a lot more of them than a founder can. And so the great thing from my perspective is, is when I get a chance to talk to 75 end users a quarter uh, or more, um, that far eclipses what a founder is going to get to do. Plus, the problem with the founder only talking to their customers is, again, you're inside that bubble a little bit. An analyst can come in and let a little of the air out and go, hey, that's really interesting. But I also have been speaking to people in the healthcare sector recently, and I, I spoke to four of my clients. And I don't know if you know this, but they're doing X, Y, and Z. And I also don't know if you know this, but we just did a report on this topic, which you might want to augment your thinking with. So we're an additional resource. They should balance it. I do think, uh, to further answer your question, Robin, in most big sectors, there's 40 really highly recognizable animals, yeah. generally speaking, just as kind of a rule of thumb. There's 30 or 40. That's a good number. Um, you can't talk to all of them. So there's usually a subset in that group. And I would always tell uh, a startup CEO or uh, a startup CEO who's working with a, an outside firm to set a strategy, find a top three. And they don't have to be the most expensive or from the biggest firms. Find the most interesting thinking of, the, of, of this group and then start with them. Because the interesting thing is, is the more you inform one or two or three analysts about what you're doing, 
you start kind of this interesting little knowledge fire because what will happen is, is that analyst will mention your company in front of the other analysts and so on and so on and so oh, on. So there is a certain, that way, yeah. yeah and, and, and I've done that, you know, where I've had other analyst friends come up to me after giving a, you know, we might all be at a big event and I might've given a presentation and they'll go X, Y, Z Corp. Uh, what's going on there? You know? And it's like, uh, you know, I I talked to them a fair amount and they're doing some interesting things. And that's why I included them on that slide about, you know, X technology. So, um, you know, don't boil the ocean as, as we like to say in our industry, yep. pinpoint your focus, but a, a strategic advisor for AR will always know who those three people are. Right. That's the cool thing, right? You don't have to go figure it out. You go find a company, you know, and engage with them and say, help us. And the help you should receive is here's the top three we want to bring to you first. They are influential, they're knowledgeable, they're tenured, whatever, you know, or they're experts in the in arena. And the other thing that uh, companies like yours can bring to that is we've worked with them before right. and it reduces risk. And re reduces the risk of wasted time uh, to the point of a CEO who doesn't want to pull away from customer conversations to yeah. talk to an analyst. An outside firm can vet them, understand them, and reduce that risk. Good so, advice. I think yeah. there's also an important um, distinction between, on the one hand, you want to brief analysts, and briefings are free because the value stream goes from the vendor to the analyst. So that's you're, you get a lot of information out of that. Um, and then you have the ones that you may want to, you know, subscribe to their research or to in have inquiry rights. So those mm -hmm. are two different things. And you can mix those two different things. It might be different analysts. You know, you might want to speak more yeah. to one sort and have a different kind of commercial relationship with the other sort. And we help to figure that out. And, and have, some of the bigger firms to... bring multiple yeah. analysts. So you can get different relationships within a firm. Go ahead, Chris. Sorry. And yeah, you're absolutely right. I've just looked at the time and I see it's counting down and we have two and a half minutes before Zoom cuts us off. So <laughs> we want to ask one really important final question. And um, I think, you know, your your big wishes from the startup ecosystem have come out quite a bit uh, through the um, through the conversation. But who should we interview next a and why? Is there a startup we should talk to that you've come across uh, that you find uh, really interesting in, from the perspective of their analyst relations game or a VC, an accelerator firm or another analyst? Boy, there's a, there's a handful of fun things that I'm kind of watching. I just uh, I just did a briefing with a company called DataOps.Live. Uh, I really uh, like the vector they're taking at the industry, and I think they're worth everyone if you're in the data space and you're trying to figure out your overall data operations. They're a great company to look at. From a, an analyst and thought leader standpoint, I think there's really cool things going on in our market. Uh, there's a very, uh, very well experienced and popular uh, analyst called Merv Adrian. Merv uh, recently uh he, I, he said he retired, but the point I'm making is, is he really hasn't. He's in the market. You should look at Merv Adrian, especially if you're in the data space. Uh, if you're in Europe, uh, there's a gentleman named uh, Mike Ferguson. He is a analyst and practitioner out of the UK doing really interesting data management work. Uh, you know, there's... That's the fun thing. I, I get to know, I get to work with a lot of smart people in my industry. I guess we're competitors, but we, it doesn't feel that way. There's a bit of a fraternity amongst people that have been doing it that long. And I know both of those gentlemen rather well, and uh, they're well, fantastic we'll take, experts. We'll take you up on that. We're under All one right. minute. <laughs> All right. So why don't we say goodbye and big, big thank you to Sean. I think this has been so interesting. Uh, really enjoyed the time together. Me too. Thanks a lot for having me and uh, for letting me talk about my business. Thank you so much, Sean. Great to have you with us. Speak soon. All right. Take care. Cheers. Bye. Really glad we had the opportunity to speak with Sean. It is it got, it was really clear he's truly passionate about working with uh, startups for for all the right reasons. For all the right reasons. <laughs> exactly. Find the fresh thinkers. Um, understand these new vectors into a problem, as he called it. Learn, 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 and then give, give, give. I mean, and and give in the 
at, at least in the in the sense of sharing the right questions to consider at the point where the startup really is. Right. Could be technology, could be market, could be partnering, could be investment. You know, I, I feel analyst questions can tell you so much about your true product market fit or, or the next priorities you should consider. It's amazing. Yeah. Yeah. And all, all this is is great to demonstrate your connectedness uh, with the top experts in your field and, and your market savviness, if you will, to, to your investors, to your partners or to high profile prospects. And Sean illustrated this all. He did. And I, I thought it was interesting that he said that some analyst firms don't take the time for startups because startups don't have budget. But he sees, he doesn't care because he sees that it's time well spent for him. Yeah, right. I, um, I come across such firms too, and I totally do agree with Sean's point. Um, but I feel there is a deeper problem there. Um, these analyst firms have kind of given up on taking briefings from startups because they couldn't afford the time when briefings are not productive. Um, and that is when startups don't know what industry analyst briefings are meant to be and how they work. And in these cases, startups simply, I don't know, repurpose a sales deck or some marketing slides or their investor deck, which yeah. is all good material, don't get me wrong, but it's for a different purpose. Yeah. And industry analysts need a specific set of factual, explanatory information. So presenting some self-celebrating hooray show is the surest way to burn your, your one ticket, you know? Yeah, yeah. Is Adam's relations is not meant. marketing. Sorry? It's not marketing. It's even, not even a subdivision of PR. We've seen this clearly, as you know, Chris, in the SSIA research. We've discussed it with practitioners all across the board, including PR professionals, by the way. Um, so Sean is absolutely right to emphasize his professional appreciation of startup conversations. This is the type of analyst you really want to meet, you know. <laughs> but but the issue yeah. that he mentioned um, there uh, spotlights the critical need for startups to to not DIY this. Yeah. I mean, unless they have someone with concrete AR exp expertise, not hearsay, um, but but really hands on. Um, so this is this is just not a field for a fail forward approach that is so typical and is very useful in other startup areas. But in this right. case, that's not the way to go. There are just too many competing startups entering the playing field all the time. So you want to get your opportunity right. And those analyst firms who may not generally take a startup briefing, I find they are most interested when being approached via an AR consultant who can then ensure that a briefing will be on point and time well spent. That's so true. You know, another interesting point he brought up that I, I didn't really have on my radar is how analysts get ideas into the marketplace. He used the Hadoop example. He learned about it from a CTO over casual dinner, but then that's how ideas get generated in the marketplace because he then told another analyst who shares the idea with other analysts and it took off. So it's a really, really good example of how the value of getting some of these disruptive ideas into the analyst's mind, they will mention your company to other analysts and it can go viral. True, true. Uh, this is why they should be your new best friend, really. They're keen to be able to challenge the established vendors because that's their job. You know, drive things forward, discover the new the new bits and pieces, understand where the future is going and then write about it and share that insight and, and develop that insight and, and qualify it and, and point buyers in the right direction, which, you know, you can look at it also from the perspective that this makes life so much harder for established vendors. Right. <laughs> you know? And because if you come in as a startup and you share with them your your innovation, you know, that can be a real hurdle for established vendors who just move slower than startups. And it can, on the other hand, it can really catapult a startup like you forward more than anything, you know, because their impartial word carries so much more weight than anything you could pay for. Pay for, pay for right. Exactly. So, so to get guidance on how to work your analyst engagement the right way, lean and effective and without 
spending crazy money at the wrong time for the wrong reasons in the wrong way, you know? In other words, be smart. <laughs> yes. I, I, and and what I found very well fitting with this was the question, um, what do analysts want to hear? Yeah. Sean was interesting, and I hear from a lot of analysts, he's as interested in your strategy and how you see the market as in the dials and levers and features that might be your offering. Yeah, exactly. And he, he means that as, as strategy in the true sense. You know, there's millions of pages being written about strategy this, strategy that, and, but he really means the core essentials of strategy. So what big bet is this company making for what specific observations and how does it prepare to be best positioned for it? Right. That is means a set of coherent decisions, coherent business decisions that you make, where you focus, how you win, what systems you leverage, et cetera, so that you will be best prepared to put um, best positioned when your informed expectations of that market future turn out as true. So that's what 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 they consider as strategic thinking. Um, and and there, I feel our, our listeners can see how important it is to understand analyst relations in depth and get substantial guidance in preparing analyst conversations. You know, this is not some sweet talk. You want to be able to demonstrate deep competence in these. Yeah. Things. Oh, this is so so right on. And it, anyway, I just want to switch to another question we get from startups all the time: Is there any value in doing AR? if there's no reports or research in your space oh yes oh yes so so yeah so sean's answer and and da, 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 drum roll that's exactly why and when you should talk to analysts because they're always looking for new ideas and angles and if you're solving a real problem faced by many real users you can drive the research agenda and even if you're, um, what do you say, if you're driving a new vector into solving an ex existing problem, if that is compelling, then you may change the evaluation criteria for all the established firms and maybe even launch a whole new area of research. Exactly. And, and, and how powerful is that? You know, especially when established vendors um then try to adopt the new buzzword, you know, um, but cannot really deliver on it. This happens so often, you know, <laughs> I've been there so many times and it can be so frustrating, especially for a startup who, who've put their intelligence and their creativity and their view of the market into this. And then, you know, somebody steals your thing and just calls, calls out the name and, and, and that's it, but yeah. they can't deliver on it. And industry analysts, are the ones to call that out for you and hold their feet to the fire, you know? And, and that gives startups, as true innovators, the power that they need to break into a market or even disrupt it altogether. Oh, true. That is so true. Oh, my God. I feel like we could go into every minute of the interview because he had so many points of concrete advice for startups. So what do you think are a few others that stood out? Um. Well, um, build broad awareness first. Most segments have maybe 30, 40, 50 highly influential analysts, um, but you cannot continuously work with all of them if, you, if you're small. Um, so step number two, um, find an analyst or, or a few, um, not necessarily the large firms, but, but those with the most interesting questions. I mean, it could be the large firms, but it doesn't have to be. And, and find those analysts with the most interesting questions and those who are also not afraid to tell you where you may be wrong or where there's a risk. You, know, you may disagree and that's fair, um, but get their, get their market insight in for your consideration. Be interested in that perspective. Keep them, and then keep them close to your journey. You know? Yeah, and you know what? Even, even, it's even good if they do disagree because if you've got good justification, you can have a really rich dialogue and gain the respect. Yeah, yeah. The, the more they understand um, your decision making, your thinking, and, and see how you evolve um, substantially, the, the better they can actually help you. And the more likely you are to be mentioned in their research or recommendations. You know, how, how about you, Robin? What, what, did, what else did you find outstanding? I love his concept of, of how analysts pop the bullet, uh, pop the bubble, I'm sorry, pop the bubble. 
and that you need to stick your head out of the echo chamber. That was really powerful. Yeah, it reduces risk, you know. But, yeah. But it also may, may find you some previously unseen opportunity, you know, yes. at the very least. And least is probably a terrible word here. It, it <laughs> demonstrates uh, to, to your investors and your partners and so on that you are best connected with the right people and truly um, you're ahead of the game. You know, that, that is so important. You know, speaking of ahead of the game, something that John Collins of GigaOM also mentioned is that analysts can help you speak the language of your target audience, which is especially relevant the newer the technology is. Because no matter how great your solution is, it only gets traction if you can connect it to how your target audience is thinking about their challenges. Great point. Great point. Let me, um, let me see what else. Um, well, of course, I I love that he put into words um, that what we as AR consultants regard as our core value proposition, especially to startups, which is if you're working with an AR professional, it means immediate trust on the analyst side, you know, it, it eliminates the, the risk of wasted time and it gets better value both to the analyst and into the startup business and all of that much quicker, you know, with less effort put in, less dead ends to follow and so on. So this is so, so important to, to startup founders, especially CEOs, subject matter experts, basically anyone in that game, yep. because they have so much on their, on their plate and everything has to happen at once. And um, we've had that come out very clearly in the in the CEO research as well. Right. So it, yeah. it is great to get that live on tape, if you will. <laughs> right. it's, we all need a little love from time to time. <laughs> Thanks, Sean. We love you. <laughs> we love you. <laughs> so wouldn't that be a great um, end for this episode? Yeah, I think so. <laughs> well, then let's wrap it up. Um, we hope you enjoyed the show as much as we did. Um, any questions on these topics, just let us know. Yeah, and, and let us know, as always, who, who you'd like to hear from next, an analyst, a VC, an accelerator, a startup, anybody in that whole world. Drop us a note. Please do. And with that, um, thank you so much for watching and listening, and uh, we hope you have a great day. Bye. Bye.